Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the sixth in the series of fine webinars. Uh, this is how to guide the sceptical patient to want what they need without sales pressure. Uh, Michael Cernix kindly agreed to, to take this for us. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm one of the directors of Fine Company. Um, so uh, Lucy, who's arranged the event, if you've got any questions uh, throughout, the, um, throughout the presentation, please send them across to Lucy and she'll send them over to us at the end. Uh, if you've got any questions following up, please get in contact with us and we can see how we can help. Uh, Michael Cernick is uh, he, he's a really interesting thinker, one of the leading authorities in dentistry globally. Um, fundamentally, he is a dentist uh, and uh, he's been a dental principal in the past. He's had practices in Australia and the UK uh, and he has worked in the Republic of Ireland as well. So he does know our market. He's an international speaker and trainer. Uh, so he's trained all over the Southern Hemisphere in America, in Canada, uh, and hopefully soon in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and he's the founder of Channel D. Uh, so Channel D is a, a, a practice waiting video software, uh, which, which actually dovetails quite nicely with what his presentation is going to talk about today. Uh, and I believe Michael's going to talk about Channel D a bit more. And so we met Michael probably 12 months ago, and it was through the Channel D service uh, one of our clients was actually using it and we were interested by it uh, because it was brilliant basically uh, so we started speaking to michael uh, as you do i was picking his brain to get some um some information from someone who's obviously had decades and decades of experience um, and i started speaking about our problems so a fine company and a wider group were really good at helping dental practices from a business perspective uh, so if you're sorting out your financial model, we can help. If you need more new patients and have a marketing and sales system, we can help. But the bit we couldn't help with is how do you get your clinical team, the engine of the business, the production team, to actually start producing more high value dentistry from their general dentist, dental patient base. Um, obviously, we've got no clinical experience. And the only practices that really managed to do it is when the principal was a really good mentor. So they had the time to spend with the team uh, developing them and teaching them the skills. Um, so I explained this to Michael and he said, well, funnily enough, um, I've developed a course over my decades of experience that answers that very specific problem. Um, why don't you come and see it? So it so happened the course was in Sydney. So I jumped at the opportunity to uh, go over to Australia and see the course. And I, complete, I was completely blown away. Uh, even though I've got no clinical experience, there was so much in there that was just so powerful and so profound. And exactly what we need uh, so what we'd agreed to do is actually bring michael over to the uk and to ireland uh, actually in may uh, to to run the course so in dublin bristol and london uh, unfortunately we all know why that's on hold for the moment uh, but we are currently scheduled to run the events in mid-september uh, so please let us know if you want to register interest for that uh, and we'll keep you posted if anything changes with it um, so I think this is going to be a great webinar. It's, it's just a taster of, of what Michael can offer. Um, we're going to have a short Q&A at the end. This will be about 55 minutes, but I think it's, uh, it's a good time to hand over to Michael and uh, enjoy. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate it. It is, um, was amazing having you come all the way from the UK to have a look at one, uh, one day of, of me talking, and uh, I was very flattered but it's been a very interesting and very nice relationship that I've had with you. And so I thank you. Okay. So everybody, hello. It's, um, what's the time now? It's quarter, almost 20 to 7 PM where I am. I live on a farm in Australia. I've been a dentist for many de decades. Um, I've owned five practices in you, including my first one, which was in the UK. I lived in the UK for, for six years. My first two children were born there. Uh, I was also an owner of the largest practice management consultancy in the Southern Hemisphere for 13 years, and that was out, out of Australia. And then in the early 2000s, I created a five-day communication program that I delivered many times a year, actually, at a large postgraduate dental institute in Las Vegas. So I used to fly to Las Vegas five, six times, eight times a year. Um, the whole five days of that course was just about the one hour new patient exam in those days. And I think actually we're entering an age where it's gonna be harder and harder to have practice success. I think there's gonna be a lot of unemployment coming up and all sorts of, of mess. 
So in my opinion, the biggest variable to success in a dental practice is actually the communication skills of the whole team. You might not know it, but there are two diametrically opposed ways of communicating with patients. Most people don't know that. They know one way, which is what they're doing. So I'm going to be showing you a different approach altogether. And since my approach is, I think, counterintuitive, I'll uh, be putting together also an online program. I'm starting to do that now to teach people how to apply it. It's gonna be a little while before that's finished. But at the end of this webinar, if you're interested, I'll give you a link and you can just register interest. There's no commitment. I've also created a communications and engagement tool that Dan mentioned called Channel D. And I did that because I had a different vision of what was needed in, in the waiting room. And I couldn't find anything out there that did what we wanted to do, so we built one. So I'll give you the links to that as well at the end. Now, crass commercialism, and by the way, I've just been in the States for eight months. I just came back because of the coronavirus. And this is the sort of thing you see all over the place, but you see it all over the world now. And it's transformed the profession. And at one end, we've made great clinical advancements, but this sort of message that we also project to the broad public isn't, isn't helping much. So when we get calls from patients who want to know the cheapest price for treatment, that sort of annoying call that everybody gets. This is really the sort of thing that's making it worse. It's all this crass commercialism. And the problem with that is it affects our relationships with our patients. Um, more patients are seeing dentists as salespeople. And you can understand why, because we're putting out those messages that we're trying to sell something. So we as a professional never feel comfortable if we're, trying to, if we're coming across like that. So these are some of the forces out there that interfere with our patient relationships. And I'm going to explore this a little bit more because if you want to grow your practice, let's first look at the things that are threats to growing the practice. And understanding the problem before you look at a whole lot of solutions is very fundamental for any problem solving. A lot of dentists are interested in growing their practices these days. And one option is to look at communications courses. They're very common now, they're becoming more common and everybody's doing something online now. And you'll see a ton of courses that fundamentally have a name like how to get your patient to say yes. And it's, uh, like I say, it's very common. The problem is that if that's the general gist, you're trying to convince the patient to buy something from you. And the obvious word for, the, word for that is sales. So you're in the sales business if you follow those types of courses, and yet they're the most common courses and everybody thinks that's all there is, that's all you can do. So just imagine yourself going to any healthcare professional and you feel just a little bit of sales pressure from that person. For me, that can be a deal killer. And the selling procedures can be a bit creepy for patients and it can build a lot of suspicion. So selling has its risks. And if you look at social media, the number one complaint on social media regarding dentists is that they tried to sell me treatment that I didn't need, expensive treatment often that I didn't need. And if you find yourself sort of uh, being tagged in something like this, you could end up in some social media nightmare where it's very hard for you to get it off. And you know, you'll hashtag avoid this dentist and everybody hates you. And frankly, I've seen practices over the years really become destroyed through this. So having a defensive approach is, is the first thing to do anyway. And that's a big part of what I'm going to be talking about, um, of how to construct your conversations in such a way that you never get on anything like that. That's one thing that you'll achieve out of this, I hope. So the need for communications is growing though. Um, there's a lot of things we say. When you, if I were to sit in your practice and, and, and clock what you do, and I've done, <laughs> we've actually done this with practices, 50% of the day is, is done with actual dentistry. The other 50% of the day is with other things, specifically talking, a lot of talking. Team members will say that their dentist talks too much and they can't shut that dentist up. Every year we have more and more things to say. We have speeches that we routinely repeat day after day. And I've just quick, quickly written a list of some of the things that we say all the time, and it wouldn't be hard to get 100 on that list. And if you look at that list there, these are the types of things that we find ourselves uh, explaining to the patients. 
Um, I can go on and on a bit with this sort of list. There's lots of things we're doing. And as I said before, every year, this list gets bigger because we're making advancements. And um, you're gonna be talking about things next year that you weren't talking about this year, but the things you're talking about this year still are, are on the list. And it goes on and on, all the things that you say. The problem is that we're now f f saying the same thing over and over every day. It's draining on the dentist. It's difficult on the patient. You don't know when to stop. And so the question is, how can we speak less and be more effective? Because we still have lots of messages to give across, but it's really hard. And so some people go to courses and a, another common theme for communication courses is something like this. It's, you know, 10 tips and scripts for case acceptance. The problem here is that the scripts and tips don't really work that well. If you've ever sort of written down all these things and you start to sprout them out, it's not all that comfortable because you're sort of working almost like on cue cards and you can feel like you're this guy here um, just, you know, memorizing things. Now, by the way, I think scripts are very useful, but they're more useful for team members answering things like the phone, especially if you've never done it before. That can be useful. But when it comes to the dentist talking to the patient, each situation actually requires a different script. And communications in the real world is very organic. It's very unpredictable. Uh, we need overall strategies before we get into the fine details. of, And we need to step back and see the big picture before we dive in and try to learn more scripts and tips. So I've said so far, courses that are called How to Get a Yes, and the other side of it is courses that are giving a lot of scripts and tips, I think still miss the problem, miss the big picture here. So I'm gonna now step back and explain a little bit more of what I think uh, we should be doing. It starts for me, well, it doesn't start, but I read this book um, in about 2000 and uh, there's Richard Taylor. He wrote a book in 2017. So I'm just uh, skipping ahead in myself here. He got a Nobel prize for his contributions in the field of behavioral economics, showing how human traits and biases affect supposedly rational markets. And what I was about to say before was that he wrote this book in 2008, and I didn't read it till about 2016. Now, for many years before that, I ran a five-day communications course that I mentioned, and that was teaching people how to steer patients into making better treatment decisions. When his book came out, I saw that it described a very similar approach to the courses that I'd run for years. Um, didn't get a Nobel Prize. But uh, my system actually just evolved through years of trial and error. There were no experiments. It was just literally the real world of dentistry and no noticing what worked, what didn't. And so I ended up creating a theory from my clinical practice and I then turned it into a course. I, I didn't start off looking to run courses. It's just that all this knowledge started to build up and then I ran courses, but it was all based not on books, it was based on the real world of dentistry. And if it wasn't working like that, I wouldn't have put it in the course. So I know it all works because that's where it all came from. By the way, the nudge system, you may have heard about it because it's, it's used by the, the governments in the UK and Germany and Japan, also the World Bank, the UN, the European Commission. And basically it's taking applied psychology and applying it on an international scale. But to understand it very quickly, to give you some principles here, uh, I'll throw this at you for a minute. Um, it's not about how to aim for the right uh, target, but it's very much an example of how principles can be used. Because what happened is it started in 1990 it's at the Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. They tried a whole lot of instructive signs. They tried educated messages, but finally they found a way that wasn't based on giving instructions for men to pee with more accuracy and they didn't give education. And so the normal things that you would think about just telling people what to do isn't how they solved this problem. What they did is um, they, they found a way of allowing for free choice, essentially for people to pee wherever they wanted to, but it changed the behavior. And what they did is they stenciled a small image of a fly onto the porcelain and boys being boys predictably aimed at the fly and the problem was solved. So that was a sort of a counterintuitive, interesting concept, but there's some principles behind it. And the communications principles that I use in, in my process with patients has some similarities, not that not urinal, but it's first of all, it's not based on detailed education. It's still allowing the patient to freely choose whatever suits them. 
and it's not based on making recommendations, but at the same time, we end up with fantastic results, better results than we would have had we instructed and educated and told people what to do, which is why I'm doing this. So it's not just about not looking like a salesperson, it's actually because we get such high results from it that when you then put it together, you start to understand, gee, this is all worthwhile. So one of the things you'll see number three there, which is not based on making recommendations, that usually makes dentists raise their eyebrows because they think, well, if we don't make recommendations, how do we guide the patient to optimum treatment? That should be the first question. If I said, we don't recommend it, you think, well, how does that happen? Well, the thing is, if you don't recommend, you would think they would always choose the cheapest thing. And that would be true, but that's missing the point because there's another way of getting the patient to make the right choices and recommendations got nothing to do with it. To sort of give you a little bit more, uh, sort of a, an overriding principle, uh, think of a, a sweeper in the, the sport of curling where they clear the path and they influence the trajectory without even touching the moving object. So they're not touching the object, but they're doing something in front of it, which clears the path, right? Think of, we drop breadcrumbs. The patient can choose to follow or not, but we control what breadcrumbs we drop and where we place them. So we still have some control, but we're not forcing it. So let's start to put it into dental terminology because one of my objectives here is to give you something that you can li literally walk away from and start to use. But I'll caution you before I get into this detail that um, there's more to it than what I'm gonna talk about simply because it takes time to, to get your head right around the whole thing. So let's start with some terminology. C1, I'm going to call that the minimum choice. C2 is the compromise choice and C3 is the ideal choice. Now there might only be two choices or there might be three, but I'm just talking in terms of three just to explain the process. That's basically it. Now, instead of recommending the optimum choice, the ideal choice, C3, what we're gonna do is something a little counterintuitive. We're going to eliminate C1 and C2. Okay, so we're not even talking right now about C3, we're not gonna sell it. We're, going, we're not gonna tell the patient why C3 is the best, which is the ideal choice. In fact, we're not, at this stage, not even mentioning it. All we're doing is explaining C1 and C2. And we do it in such a way that uh, it may seem to be even a reasonable choice. In other words, as we talk about C1 and C2, the patient may be thinking, oh, that's not too bad because we're not going to denigrate them even though we don't want them to do C1 and 2. But on balance, you're gonna find the patient will 99 times out of 100 reject C1 and C2, even though it feels like a complete free choice. I'll explain this a little bit more. As I say, it takes a bit of time to get your head around all this. So the patient will be the one to eliminate the suboptimum choices, not us. They're gonna feel like they could have chosen whatever they liked. And we're never indicating what they should or should not do. We're completely neutral in this process and it's all in their hands. Now, as I say, any of this stuff, there's probably 10 questions that come to your mind. What if they ask you, uh, what should I do? There's all those questions. Trust me, we've got all that figured out. So if you can just follow along with me for a moment, you'll understand it a little bit better. And then all those extra questions, we can either talk about them at the end of today, or if you ever do one of my other programs, you'll understand how it completely gets handled. Moving on a bit, if there are three options and two are not viable, that just leaves one viable option. So C3 becomes the default by elimination, not by persuasion. We're not using selling skills, we're not using convincing skills, we're not using persuasion skills. So let's just get into the real dentistry for a minute. Now, the example I'm gonna use here is a very common situation. Let's say it's a heavily filled tooth, you can see the amalgam there, and I'm assuming that the best treatment is going to be in our, in this example, it's going to be a ceramic bonded restoration. The communications principles can be applied to any dental scenario. So even though I'm only talking about a simple thing, which is an amalgam going to a ceramic, this could be orthodontics, this could be anything. So a perio, airway issues, whatever you can think of, the, the, it's a principle we're talking about. We're not talking about a script. 
So if we were talking about a heavily filled tooth with some decay and no pain, we could say something to the patient when we're talking about the minimal treatment choice, which is C1, we could say something like one choice is to just do nothing for a while. And while it's, it's the lowest cost option. Uh, now, understand, first of all, we didn't start out by saying, you know what, you really need to do something about this weak tooth because it's cracked. We said the opposite. We said that one choice is to do nothing for a while. It's the lowest cost option. The reason this system is already counterintuitive is that even though you don't want them to select the minimum treatment, the C1, we're going to start by saying something vaguely positive about it, which is you could leave it. It's, it's, at the moment, it's the lowest cost option. But then we've got to talk about the disadvantages of leaving it. And we could say something like, um, uh, we could say something that would want the patient to take actions. So now we explain the disadvantages of doing nothing. And the words could be, as you can see up on the screen, something like, however, the tooth has decay, it's weak, and it's likely to fracture, which could lead to a difficult extraction for this type of tooth. And then we move on. Um, and now we're going to take away all the pressure and give them a reason to take no action again. Again, the counterintuitive bit. And I would say, but if money's tight right now, or if you want to delay having any treatment, you could just try to eat on the other side. And, um, you know, when you're ready, you could come back. Then you wait for a response. Now you'd have to be silent. It's really important that the patient says something at this moment, because had you just kept talking and talking, you would have ended up giving the patient all of their choices about composite or ceramic, and you would have said everything. And when you do all of those choices, which is what most people do, you'll get a very predictable answer, which is, I need to think about it. Frankly, you've just scrambled their brains. So we always try to give a single sort of a binary choice and allow the patient to give us their response. Now, most patients will not really want to have to worry about any potential problem left in their mouth. They don't want to worry that if they bite hard, it's going to split under the gum and it'll be a difficult extraction. So they'll typically say, no, no, I don't think I want to worry about that. What are my other choices? And that's typically what happens. So as a, just a very quick recap, talking about C1 choice, which as you can see, we've gone through saying something, the advantage of doing nothing. Then we've talked about the disadvantage of doing nothing. And then we've gone back and we've sort of given them uh, a takeaway, which is, uh, but if money's tight, just eat on the other side. It's, it's again, almost telling them they can, uh, they can do nothing. But what they'll remember very much is the fact that the tooth has decay, it's weak, and they have to be careful biting on it. So as a quick sort of um, schema for the whole thing, C1, we've said something positive about doing nothing, something negative, which is very important, and then something positive again. We've, we've, the green filling is, is like a sandwich, and we always want to be going for the filling of the sandwich, the middle bit. So let's just continue for a minute. And by the way, if the patient already expressed concern about this tooth, you wouldn't have even given them the option of doing nothing because that would have been illogical. They've come in saying, I'm concerned about this tooth. You're not going to say, well, you can do nothing. That's obviously doesn't make sense. When we get to C2, uh, this is a, comp a compromise choice. We'd be saying something like, look, again, we're going to say something positive. We could remove the decay. We can use a composite filling. And that would stop the decay for now. And the cost is, and you give them the exact cost. And that's what you say at that moment. Then you continue, but the composite is plastic. It's not going to prevent this type of tooth from breaking. So it's good that we've got the decay. It would still be best to avoid eating on that side. And then you could come back out and say, but it's good we got the decay out and, and it'll slow the process down by doing this. So the patient now would have heard the middle bit, the disadvantage of the composite. And most people wouldn't, again, for the same reasons, wouldn't want to have to be careful about biting on this side. So very often, even though we haven't talked about C3, the patient's now saying, what else is there? If they've said no to the first two. They might have said yes to one of them, in which case I can discuss that as well. We're going to allow them to do whatever they want, of course. So as a quick scheme of the whole thing, there it is, um, the three bits of that, saying something uh, ad advantageous, to C2, disadvantageous, and then advantageous again. It's the same process as C1. And again, it's that, that's uh, the way you can see it graphically. 
we package the negative reason between two positives, okay? Now, again, you wait for the choice. You never want to discuss the optimum treatment, which is C3, until the patient actually asks us about it. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and if they've already said they, uh, and, and if we've done that, and they've already said they don't want the alternatives, that's when we can talk about C3. Another way of looking at this is imagine if you're a room, there's a fire in the room, there's three doors, two of them are locked, you've only got one door to lead through. And that's what we've created already. So the talking, if the patient says, no, what else is there? Now you can talk about C3 because they've asked you for it. So I'll show you how to discuss the third choice, which is about having a ceramic inlay. Here's where it gets really counterintuitive again, because we start by saying something negative about the ceramic inlay, which is the treatment that we actually think is the ideal. And yet we're going to say something negative. So we, we could start by saying, look, the last option is the most expensive. It involves a ceramic restoration and the cost is, and you give the full cost and we must tell them the full fee here. Now you could say, look, not everyone would choose this because of the cost at this moment. It, it's what most dentists would choose for themselves because it's the strongest and looks the best. That's the, that's the thing that's the advantage. And then you go to the disadvantage again. Now you could say something like, but because of the cost, it's not for everyone. And if, if you think it's totally out of the question, just tell me and I won't bring it up again. So you've totally backed off. Now what, what's happened now is you've essentially sandwiched the ideal thing in a way that that's what they listen to. And you've packaged it in each way on each, at the beginning and the end to take away the sales process. And what you'll get from this typically is the patient would say, well, look, no, I don't think it's totally out of the question. That's if they want to find out more. So the optimum treatment, did we actually want to hear a yes or did we hear a no? The patient said in this example, no, I don't think it's out of the question. We wanted to hear a no. So instead of trying to talk the patient into agreeing with a sales proposal, we're actually hoping they say no. This is the opposite of sales. We want disagreement, not agreement. The patient doesn't feel like we're tracking, trying to talk them into anything. And we aren't. We want the patient to feel no pressure from us. It's 100% their choice. And just like Nudge, we're invisibly guiding them to make a better treatment choice. And we actually are genuinely okay with whatever they choose. The more you're desperate for the patient to choose what you think is the best treatment, the more they feel that you're sort of trying to do that to them. So you need to put yourself in a mindset where you're completely neutral. So when you look at the summary of this Cernic sandwich, we're always guiding the patient to decide on the content of the green square. The envelope, uh, we envelope our agenda between these points. And this is, how, um, this is how we put it all together. The question is, did we actually make a recommendation? And obviously, no, I never ever make recommendations in this type of environment. And the whole point of not making a recommendation immediately means I can never be rejected. Rejection is impossible. There's no sales pressure. You're never going to be, you know, accused of trying to push somebody into anything because if you do it correctly, the patient is feeling that you are there giving them free choice and it makes it okay with whatever they choose. And at the end, they're actually going to be disagreeing with you in a sense to choose the treatment that they want. So we're, we're, we're taking them into a point where they have to cross a certain barrier and they know that they've just done that. So our obligation is to make sure really that the patient only is aware of two things. The problem is that what we want is the problem they have, which is a weakened cracked tooth. They need to know the damaging result of the existing condition, which I call the DREC. It's the biggest psychological driver in our communications. In this example, the patient didn't want C1 or C2 because they didn't like the DREC. They didn't like the outcome. They didn't like what could happen to them if they leave it, which is the tooth splitting and becoming a problem. That DREC part is the biggest driver in this scenario for this patient. It's what will drive them into wanting something done. The worry that if they do nothing and they bite, something will happen that is nasty. 
And if there's no direct, there's not a lot of motivation here. So there's always got to be some direct in the equation here for people to be motivated to do something. It's not the positive thing that is driving them, it's the negative that's driving them, which again is somewhat counterintuitive. Immediately that makes it doesn't feel like sales. Anyway, if the patient knows that they have a problem and they're not asking about solutions, that actually means they're not interested. So if they're not interested, frankly, there's no point in explaining too many details or wasting time. The strategy is not needing to explain all the treatment. Uh, it saves a lot of time if you don't have to explain everything. So in Nudge, in the, in the book and the whole system, they describe the whole process as paternal libertarianism and choice architecture. That's their terminology. It's paternal because uh, we know more about the ideal treatment than the patient does. It's what we would have chosen for ourselves. And it's libertarianism because they can choose whatever they want and there's no pressure at all from us. It's choice architecture because we offer choices without any pressure. We're structuring their choices, like I said, dropping the breadcrumbs, and we sequence the choices. But it's them that makes the choice. It takes the pressure away. And while it might sound a little complex for you the first time, understand that this is the overall schema. When you know how to do this well, it happens quick, it happens intuitively, and it saves a hell of a lot of time because you know exactly where you're going. The whole case presentation thing takes about two or three minutes. That's about it. So it's super fast, very effective, and you know where you stand and there's no pressure. So like I say, um, I like to get from A to Z as quickly as possible. And that's what this is about. But sometimes trying to explain the whole process, it's like explaining to a carpenter uh, who's new all the uses of every tool. And at the end of the day, the experienced carpenter might just get a hammer and hit something and then it's all just done. So you, you, you use the tools well when you understand how to use them all and learning them all can take time. So since we're discussing solutions to problems, let's just go back for a moment and re-examine the problems that we're dealing with. And here's a question. What percentage of your patients come in and see you and categorically tell you exactly what they need? They're 100% correct in their self-diagnosis. There's nothing more to do nothing less to do, they're dead accurate on what they told you needs to be done. And when I ask that question of dentists in groups and things, they'll usually say, very often someone will say nobody, uh, but usually it's sort of a very low number, it's like 5% or something. So here's the then question, and taking this concept just a little bit further, so if most of our patients don't really know what we see, what do patients really want? I think universally we could say they don't want pain, they want to look better, and they probably want to spend as little as possible. Most patients probably fit into that category. And what are the things that we see though? On one side, this is what they want. What do we want? What do we see? We see a lot of stuff. And I'll put up, you know, replacing missing teeth, replacing weak fillings, T TMD, uh, prevention work, airway, malocclusions, cosmetics, gum disease, it goes on and on. What's common about everything that we're doing on that, on that list there is they're all chronic painless conditions, which means they've been there for a long time and typically the things that we're treating in everyday dentistry isn't actually hurting the patient. It's not that urgent in the patient's mind. And so you've got the patients where they come in just wanting some often minimal stuff. You know, they just don't want to be in pain. They don't want to spend a lot of money and all the rest of it. And yet we see all these things that we think needs to be done and they're not aware with, of them. And if we give them just what they want, we're going to be really under treating people. So if you, you know, in normal sales, it's like find out what the customer wants, give it to them. Well, that's not what dentistry is about at all. Here, the customer doesn't know what they want. Maybe a couple of percent know what they want that is correct. Most of the time, what they want is not what we want to give. And that's what makes it particularly difficult because that already puts us in a situation where psychologically, if we're trying to do high level dentistry, we're gonna find ourselves talking people into stuff all day. And that's the problem because when you're talking them into things and they feel you're talking them into them, it's just like, again, you going to adopt and, and you feel that that person has some sort of you know, financial interest in their, in, in their diagnosis here. And that doesn't work well for growing a practice. You have to do a lot of work to try to fix that mess up. 
So we've got chronic pain conditions on one side and 95% of patients aren't even aware of the things, chronic painless conditions, I think I said, and 95% of patients aren't even aware. So this is a huge gap. This is the communications gap that we have in dentistry. And um, I wouldn't say it's completely unique to dentistry, but there's an awful lot of sales situations where it's not like this, uh, where you're just trying to give the patient, the person what they want. In dentistry, giving them what they want will end up me, us doing crappy dentistry or sub, suboptimum dentistry, to put it technically. So as we explain the issues, the patient often will give us signals that they're not interested. So every day we hear things like, but it doesn't hurt as an objection, or they'll say, I need to think about it, or I just can't afford it, or I need to ask my husband, my wife, my cat, any excuse will do. We hear these things all the time, and when we go to courses, often we're told these are objections which need to be handled. I would like to sort of go past all of these objections. I don't want to hear them because you can't tell whether they're genuine or whether what I call polite evasion. Polite evasion is they're using these, they don't want it, and they're trying to tell you in the nicest polite way, I don't want it. But often we don't pick it up, so we then sort of harass them. We try to explain it again. We send them stuff. We call them a few days later. Have you made your mind up? Do you know what you want to do? And we set up a whole chain reaction of communication that from the patient's point of view feels almost like you're stalking them and, and that you're annoying them. And from their point of view, they said no, but they didn't say it in a very specific way. They didn't just flat out say no. And so there's this sort of gray area where nobody's quite clear of what's going on. What I described before that with that sandwich technique completely eliminates that. You never get this at all. You don't even get any of it. You just don't get it. So um, that makes a huge difference in your world as well. You just don't get objections for a start. So if you made a recommendation and the patient signaled polite evasion, handling objections by talking more, educating more, just feels like more sales pressure. So you're sort of in quicksand and you're digging yourself into a deeper hole here. So the entire approach is reactive because you start doing all the talking towards the end of the appointment when you've looked at everything and now you're talking more and more and you never know where it ends. Even after they've left, you can still be calling them to find out what they want to do. So changing minds and trying to turn a negative view into a positive view is really, really difficult. If they've said no and they meant no, by the way, you can talk people into stuff if it's low cost. You know, you need three Fisher seals to hell with it, I'll do it. Just get you off my back. But you need three implants and I'm thinking I don't need any implants, I don't want them, I'm fine. Now it's a problem. And so trying to talk them into this stuff is when you get into deep trouble. And then, it, as I said, it can lead into uh, being on social media in the wrong way. In preemptive communications, the patient is interested and engaged before any treatment is engaged, sorry, is discussed, I meant. So that's a very interesting thing. We don't even talk about C3 until they're interested, okay? We don't discuss the details. Explaining to somebody how treatment is done doesn't make them that excited, okay? So this whole process, to be preemptive, it's useful to begin this whole nudging process in the waiting room or the lounge, if you want to call it that. I don't care what word you use, by the way. I know in practice management consultancy, there's a sort of um, social etiquette that it can't be a waiting room because you're not waiting. Um, it's not my thing. Um, if you've got nothing to say, then I train people on that. But that's, that's not, for me, let's just call it the waiting room. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, the video system that I've uh, usually seen get, goes into a lot of detail of how treatment is done. Most people will have these videos that tell people how a crown is done, how an implant is done, how many appointments are needed, and it's the process. And telling somebody how an implant is done, that we're gonna cut the gum, we're gonna drill, blah, blah, we're gonna stick something in, doesn't make me want it. So if the patient understood the potential outcome though of having missing teeth or the problems with long-term dentures, then they're much more curious. In other words, we're back to the direct. If I know that my missing teeth are going to cause me a problem and I'm very clear about that problem, if that problem makes sense and I'm, I don't want that to happen, now I'm interested in what my solutions are for my missing teeth. 
but you hitting on me saying you've got a missing tooth, I recommend an implant. This is how we do implants. You've, you've lost me there. And I'm exaggerating because I know you don't quite do it that way, but it sort of is like that too. A lot of people do it that way. Those videos were like this. So there are certain requirements for videos to be effective in the waiting room. They always have to be silent, by the way. If you run sound in videos, it's really intrusive. Patients will say, can you turn that off? It's driving me nuts. They need to give the patient the impression that they were created by you. If the patient thinks you're just running dental ads, I can promise you most patients aren't running to YouTube looking at um, lots of dental videos. They're not as excited about technology as you. They might look some things up, but they're not going to be watching 15 minutes of dental videos when they've got their phone. They'll just look at their phone. But if they see that the videos are sort of personal coming from you to them, especially if there's photos of you involved in the videos, suddenly they're gonna be looking, they're personal from you to them. And if the team is trained, there are sort of nudge type of techniques that get the patient to want to look. And it almost makes them feel like it's rude for them not to look, so they will. And again, there's a little bit of training around that, but let's just imagine you get patients now to look at some of these videos. They have to be short, about 60 seconds is all you can do. People don't have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, patience to look at everything. Now, let's say you have a microscope. It's good for the patient to know that you use a microscope, but it's even better when they see you on the screen. And we want the messages just to be about you more than about your microscope, to be honest. So the scripting needs to be smart enough to achieve these types of objectives. You'll be surprised how many patients you'll get when you give your patients actually something to tell their friends. Years ago, I was the second person in Australia, dentist, to have a laser. And I got so many patients out of that. That laser wasn't very good. I hardly used it very much. But the value I got out of the laser was massive because suddenly I had the reputation of being the laser dentist. And if you market it in such a way internally, even if for whatever equipment you may have, if the, don't forget that a lot of your patients will come from patients talking to patients, but what they need is content to talk about. And so again, the, uh, the, the, you could make a, a microscope be one of these talking points. Um, and those patients that come to you from existing patients really are the best patients. Even if only two patients a day are paying close attention to a, a video, that's 40 extra conversations per month, right? 220s, 40. 40 a month, 480 a year. It's nearly 500 people a year going to be influenced by some content that you put on the screen. And it's even better when, you, when the team and the dentist knows how to sort of leverage off that, um, that discussion. So you can end up with a lot of extra patients who are the right patients, they're qualified. And it all happened because you, you sort of set it up. So that's the beginning process. Um, there's other things you can put on the screen. I mean, uh, th uh, these are Channel D type of videos that I mentioned. Uh, we've got about, I think, 120 videos on all the, all the topics that I showed you before. We've got one for all one of those. So if you've had a new degree or a diploma or certification, it's good to have your patients know about it. The videos shouldn't look like somebody else's third party supplied them. They need to be perceived as coming from you to them. It's your content, not somebody else's. It doesn't say Channel D on it. It should be all about your practice. And um, if we haven't got the messages that you want to deliver, you tell us and we create it for you. There's no cost for this. And we leverage off those videos. And with this level of customization, Channel D is in a category of its own. It's very customized. It feels like it's, the, it's yours. Patients are paying attention. And it's all done as part of a strategic plan to get certain information into the patient's mind, like dropping breadcrumbs, so that we then take it to the next level at the next part of uh, this appointment. So it starts in the waiting room, it might as well. Uh, they're sitting there, it's the biggest room in your practice typically, and usually it's underutilized. Now, new patient coordinator, NPC. If you have a new patient coordinator, uh, I think it's very useful. Personally, I always had one, uh, even before I'd even knew the name, it was just a person that did work that talked to the patient first and prepared them. And I, I was taking photos way, way, way back uh, when it was still just, um, uh, Polaroids, because it didn't have digital those. So the patient's been in the waiting room, ideally a new patient coordinator takes some diagnostic photos. If you don't have a new patient coordinator, absolutely you can still do it yourself and that's fine too. 
I just like the idea of leverage. Having other people do what the dentist uh, doesn't have to do is, is very fundamental. And I know that when I've been talking to, to Dan um, from, um, from Fine, they really are into this idea of trying to develop practices so that they've got a lot of leverage. That's a way you can, remember I said that 50% of the time that you're in the, with the practice, you, you're just uh, talking instead of doing dentistry, that 50% could be given to other people. And now you've just doubled your potential time with patients and makes it much, um, much more effective, your clinical time with patients. Um, the photos should be displayed on a monitor that's in eyesight of the patient. So they're looking at this thing. If you've done this, you know that patients always say something. They'll look at those teeth and they'll say something like that. Boy, they're ugly. Typical patient will make a comment. And the whole purpose of this step is to just highlight a problem. The most common error made at this point is you start discussing solutions. Because I've heard this a thousand times. The patient will say, gee, they look ugly. And the dentist will say, well, which one? And they'll say, that one there. Oh, we can do a crown on that. Bang. Wrong, wrong move at the wrong time. It's a critical error. We need to work on the damaging result of the existing condition. So we start with the dreck. And that requires a big conversation, but I want you to understand that principle first. Just understand, don't jump to solutions, wrong time. Work on the problem first. It's the best if they describe their problem because you describing it is almost meaningless. You have to have techniques, which I have, which gets the patient to say to you what you had wanted to say to them. When they say it, it's worth 100. When you say it, it's worth nothing because you don't know what they're remembering or anything. If it's in their head and they're speaking it, hugely effective. So um, when they describe a problem, it becomes their problem. When you describe their problem, it's your problem. Now, if they say nothing and they're just looking at it, you can be silent and then you look at it and then you go, hmm, it's all you have to do. Next thing is they're saying what? And now we're in a conversation. If they seem detached, like I say, you could say, mm, you could be silent, you can just look, and they're very likely to get some sort of response. If that doesn't wake them up and they appear to be sort of in narcolepsy, they're just like the brain switched off, it really means that you, they're nervous and you haven't put them in what I call chat mode. See, people can be in a situation where they're shepherded through into the practice, they sat down, they're told what to do, and they're saying nothing all the time. And then you expect them to say something at this and they say nothing. Well, you need to get them in that chat mode earlier. And I'll describe it as a state of uh, social comfort and friendliness. We start the process by getting them into chat mode as soon as they enter the premises. It's useful to have the skills of the team members being able to talk to patients about things that are interesting to the patient. It's not about telling them something, it's about getting the patients to talk, of course. So ideally, we just look for little openings. That the, the, the patient might say, boy, traffic was bad. Now you could close that conversation or you can open it. Um, and you can close it by saying, yeah, everyone said that today. And that's the end of that. Or you could say, gee, I hope it wasn't too bad for you or too stressful for you. Where did you drive from? And now you're in a conversation. So you're not looking for yes or no answers. Obviously, you've got to create sort of an open question, which triggers a lot of detail. So look, over a lifetime, I've noticed that in dentistry, you could have two dentists with the same patient, same type of clinical skills, everything's the same, and you'll get very, very different results. I'm talking about orders of difference, you know, two, three, four times as much income and productivity coming out of one dentist. One's doing 2,000, one's doing 10,000 a day. It's that type of difference. Uh, very significant, and the only variable is the communications skill. It's the biggest variable in practice success. And gaining the skills doesn't have to cost a lot, and yet it can have such a big difference. I mean, I'm not saying don't have lovely decor or beautiful website or good ads or good equipment, but I am saying that you can have the best communicator in the worst area, in the worst practice, and they'll still do better dentistry and more of it than the worst communicator in the best area with the best practice, I promise you. It's just a matter of degree. And uh, if you really know what you're doing and you're a great communicator, that just changes everything. It's like a massive dial that changes your whole career. So 
You can have the best clinical skills, but unless the patient wants to have the treatment, what's going to happen is the clinical skills will just gather dust. Now, one of my pet peeves is that if you're trying to get patients to say yes, and you've done one of these courses of getting a yes, you'll absolutely sometimes get a no. Now, when they're saying no, at that moment, they're not saying no, I want it. They're saying, no, I don't like you almost. I don't want that. I don't want, you just told me you, you think I should have. No, I'm not doing it. So that's a problem. And getting rejected is, first of all, embarrassing. <coughs> Excuse me. It makes you want to give up. And so you'll go to a course to boost your confidence. That's what happens. The presenter runs on stage like a rock star. Everyone's cheering. They're told that the reason you aren't successful is because you just need to believe in yourself. Okay, so now you're into sort of faith-based dentistry, dental evangelism. And um, I've seen this sort of thing. It probably doesn't happen as much in the UK. And that's my experience of the UK. But I've just been in the United States for eight months. And I can tell you that that's what you see. An awful lot of courses are sort of like this. And the problem is that you get all uh, geared up to be excited. They're big energy boosters. And then you're going to have a low, like a sugar rush and then depression. And there's tons of these motivational courses. Look, I don't mind if you do motivational courses, if, if that's what you're wanting to do. But don't think that you're going to be a better dentist from a motivational course alone. You need to have skills. So believing yourself is nice, but, if you're, but your belief will increase when you've mastered skills and delivered measurable success. You actually need to know stuff. Frankly, I wouldn't want a dentist who has lots of belief but minimal skills with a high-speed turbine in my mouth obviously. So what I've exposed to you is an alternative to being rejected at all. Uh, you don't need to toughen up. You don't need to ignore the negatives. You don't need to sort of become bulletproof to rejection, which is what a lot of these uh, sort of approaches are. But you can be more gentle, more friendly, more genuine. And really, it's so important to have great relationships and humor and all that stuff with your patients. Now, you could um, set up a dental practice it's going to be more and more expensive these days to set up new practices. Uh, also, I think we're in a period of time where got, with the massive unemployment that absolutely is coming, uh, there's going to be more and more um, emphasis on money. You've got, you can't spend your way into popularity to grow a practice, uh, but you can deepen your relationships with a deep, different approach. Now, a lot of practices in the last 15 years set themselves up as niche practices. I'm not saying don't do that, but with all this unemployment and difficult times ahead, I think it's going to be um, a shrinking market. So patients overall need to like you and need to like your team. And if you look at that sort of picture, just impressing patients with the authority is okay. But if the patient doesn't like you, you'll probably lose them to someone else where they, they think they like that person more than they like you. So creating the right type of practice is not an accident. Even if you have natural skill, I assure you that in 10 years' time, you'll be a better communicator than you are right now. So I'm going to be running this course, this online course, where we're going to offer you the ability to uh, just put your name in, and when it's ready, we'll let you know about it, and we'll know all the details. I don't have all the details yet. But in principle, I think it's really useful to be able to leverage off other people's experiences. Otherwise, you have to go through them yourself to learn all that stuff. So if it's low cost, it's not bad to give it a try. Um, in summary, we, we create a framework of experiences. Uh, the patient can go where they want. It takes time for them to create new habits and be advanced. So that's, you're going to have to uh, develop those skills. The less tools you need, the faster you can navigate the system, though. You get much faster as, you, as these two skills become hardwired. Now, then you're not even thinking about the techniques. You don't do it any other way because it's the most effective thing you can do. I'm just uh, getting to the point where I'm finished. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I'll just put up on the screen that if you are interested in putting your name up on anything here, I think um, Lucy's put it up uh, in the comments or something. But otherwise, you can take your phone, just photograph that or contact fine and they'll give you the details. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about Channel D, not very much, but there's more to say about that. One of the things I can say about Channel D is if you subscribe, if you go online, you'll see the price right now is £135 a month. We're dropping it to £99 a month. We're just in the process of redoing the website. 
and anybody that registers wouldn't be um, wouldn't be asked to pay now for a few months. It's like two two months, I think it is. But you can try it, um, and we can create the videos for you that you need without any cost whatsoever. So that's what's happening. And um, <clears throat> once just to, to finalise, I just want to say to Dan, uh, thanks very much for having you up there um, and having me up there. You guys have done amazing things. I've seen what you've been um, producing for your clients and uh, I'm very impressed. So I would encourage any of you to, if you're not a, a client of, of uh, Fine & Company, check it out. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. That was fantastic. It was really, really good. We, uh, we did get some questions through. Um, are you are we good? Have you got time to, to answer a couple of questions? Great stuff. Sure, I've got all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't keep you too long. Um, uh, someone has asked, what if the Drek isn't scary enough? How do you, if it's kind of quite a long term thing before the, the, the issues become real, how do you, how do you deal with that? Um, to answer that question, it would be so much easier to understand what is, the, what is the clinical case that we're doing. I used to run a two-day program after I did three days, and the dentists would bring in, this is at, at, uh, in Las Vegas, the dentists would bring in their cases, their x-rays, their models, and mm. the whole works. And on a case-by-case -case basis, you would work that through. I mean, let's say somebody's got missing teeth. Obviously, that's just the beginning of the process. Uh, clearly that, you know, the teeth, are, you know, you can talk about all the things that will happen. But at the end of the day, if people are on a road that has a terminus and the terminus could be ending up with dentures, that becomes a huge, a huge driver right there. So it's a question of literally I can't answer it because I need to know specifically what is the case. Because on a person by person basis, by the way, when you talk to the people, Different people have different areas of concern. Some people aren't concerned with cosmetics. Other people are. So, but you, it, it's a nuanced answer. But that's the principle. Yeah. That's all I could say at the moment. Fantastic. Um, someone's asked, is it worth uh, asking for permission in advance to, to follow up with your patients when you've built that rapport so you're not getting this uh, hounding of them in the, in the uh, after sales process? Mm -hmm. Okay, great question, because if you follow the, the schema that I said, you actually get your answer right then and there. Yeah. You'll know where you stand. That's the beauty of it. The whole thing is a two or three minute conversation and it's over. You know, they know exactly what's going on. They've told you everything that needs to be said. It's done. When I say it's a two or three minute thing, that doesn't count everything with the photos up front. But I mean, once you've looked at the mouth, you've set the patient up and you had a conversation, that bit is really fast when you do it in a very specific way. And so, look, if you do have to follow them up, you know, let's say it's implants or something's going to cost a lot of money and they say, um, I'll have to talk to my husband. There's still some things I would be saying at that moment so that I get real clarity, okay? Um, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time going through this now because it literally one thing will lead to another. It's a bigger conversation, but at the end of the day, um, we're not getting a lot of that. And if you do have to follow that up, you would have them sort of um, saying to you, I want you to follow me up. It's not like mm -hmm. saying, do you mind if I follow you up? That comes from a different perspective. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, I can easily handle this, but it takes time. Great stuff. Um, yeah. So obviously you've covered a, you've covered a, a kind of surface level of, of uh, your knowledge today, um, but it was, it was fantastically useful. Uh, obviously, there's a deeper dive uh, that we're looking to run in September time. Um, so, so let us know if you're interested in that. Um, but yeah, it was fantastic, Michael. Thank you very much. A um, couple more points. Uh, this, you can get CPD for this. Um, so, so let us know and we'll send you out your certificate. Uh, and we're also recording the webinar, so we'll send that out to you all, and please feel free to send it on to any of your network. Um, and Michael and I were speaking before this, and we think there may be an opportunity to run at least another webinar uh, in the coming weeks that, that Michael's been working on. Um, so I think we'll, we'll um, leave that for now. If you've got any questions in the meantime, please let us know and contact Lucy, uh, and we'll try and factor them in, in in how we feedback in the future. So thank you again, Michael. Um, and uh, have a great week. Have, well, have a great evening and uh, catch up soon. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you very much. Thank you. All the best.